Good morning, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Stu Eisenstadt. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Atlantic Council, and under Barbara Slavin's direction for five years, uh, initially co-chaired and then chaired the Atlantic Council's Bipartisan Task Force on Iran. Uh, among other people, we met uh, w w three times with Foreign Minister Zarif, who was also the chief nuclear negotiator for the JCPOA, and many other Iranian officials who came through Washington at the time. Our task force presented its formal recommendations in 2013, and then following the JCPOA, we supported uh, on a bipartisan basis the JCPOA, believing that it was the best way to curb Iran's nuclear ambitions despite its imperfections. I do have a sort of personal interest in Iranian developments. I was President Carter's uh, chief White House domestic advisor, have written a book called President Carter of the White House Years, uh, and in part lost my job over the uh, hostage crisis. The Atlantic Council's future uh, Iran initiative is led by Barbara, and today we have the great pleasure of having that Iran initiative uh, together with the Friedrich Ebert Steifung, the FES. And we couldn't have chosen a more opportune time to have this panel discussion on the report that's been written by the panelists on the impact of the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran. We're meeting at a time of growing crisis between Iran and the U.S., but also between the U.S. and our allies over the decision by the administration to withdraw from the JCPO and unilaterally impose sanctions against Iran, even though the International Atomic Energy Agency and all the P5 plus one countries, including, by the way, the U.S., have indicated that the Iranian government was in compliance with the JCPOA. Iran is now facing its most severe internal demonstrations in years over reductions in fuel subsidies and other economic hardships, at least in part because of the administration's economic sanctions. Continued economic deprivation is likely, perhaps will get even worse, and there'll be more austerity measures that may be necessary by Iran, and this could potentially fuel even more domestic unrest. At the same time, we're witnessing extraordinary attacks by Iraqi citizens against Iranian consulates in Iraq, perhaps in protest against Iranian influence, but more broadly perhaps against the broad corruption in the Iraqi government. For more than a year, the Trump administration has been exercising its policy of maximum pressure on the professed notion of bringing Iran back to the negotiating table for an improved deal. But as Barbara will discuss in her writing and today, it's unclear what the actual policy of the administration is. What's not unclear is the severe impact the sanctions are having. There's no sign that Iran, however, is altering its support for terrorism or its expansionary policy. So if the purpose of the U.S. sanctions was to change conduct and to get it back to the negotiating table, there's no evidence that that is happening at all. There are 130,000 most, mostly Iranian missiles in the hands of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Iran is trying to build a permanent military base in Syria and a land bridge for the delivery of arms from Iraq, Iran to Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. It's very important to remember, and I think whatever one's views are on the JCPOA, it's almost universally agreed that Iran would not have negotiated the JCPOA had the European Union not joined with the U.S. in punishing sanctions. And they gave up much more than we did by doing so. They d deprived themselves of 16% of their energy imports coming from Iran. They agreed to sanction the Iranian Central Bank and to have the SWIFT system in Brussels refuse to clear any dollar-denominated transactions. 
So again, if the goal of the administration's unilateral sanctions, taken over the objection of all the other P5 plus one countries, is to bring Iran back to the negotiating table and reach a better deal, or to curb its other unacceptable activities, the exact opposite has occurred. Deprived of the economic benefits of the JCPOA by the U.S. withdrawal and the European Union's inability to fill that void, Iran has become more aggressive and provocative since the administration announced last spring that it would seek to prevent Iran from exporting any oil, its lifeblood. There are even reports that Iran is now stockpiling ballistic missiles in Iraq that could attack Saudi Arabia or Israel. At the same time, while Iran did comply for a year after the U.S. withdrawal with the JCPOA, now in retaliation, it's begun breaching its commitments to the JCPOA that limit its stockpiling of low-enriched uranium by increasing its enrichment levels, its commitments on the types of centrifuges it can deploy, and the venue for enrichment. This morning, we'll discuss an important new publication by the Friedrich Ebert Steifung on the results of the maximum pressure campaign and its implications for future U.S. and European policy toward Iran. Our first speaker is supremely uh, experienced in dealing with this issue. Newt Nefselson is the FEC representative to the U.S. and Canada, uh, now in Washington. And prior to that, he led the FES office in Warsaw, Jerusalem, and Shanghai. He's also served as the uh, Department of Asia and Pacific Development Program of, of the FES in Berlin, and has had extensive experience in the U.S., obtaining a master's degree in foreign service here, uh, but also serving for a year as a fellow uh, with Diane Feinstein. So with no further ado, Newt, would you be good enough to uh, make your presentation? And thank you for coming, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ambassador Eisenstadt, for this very kind introduction and generous introduction. My name is Knut Detlefs, and I represent the Friedrich Ebert Foundation here in Washington, D.C., which, and we do our work uh, in the U.S. and in Canada. And uh, I will now not give a full policy presentation. I will leave that to the panel, but I would like to give a few introductory remarks, and I would like also to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, and I would like to stress I'm very glad that we do this event together, Barbara, and I'm, I hope that together the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung as a European progressive think tank and the Atlantic Council that we can engage in a further debate on this very important issue I mean, what place do we see for the Iran, for the country of Iran, which is an important country and a, a powerful country and a difficult country in international politics? And how do we as Europeans or the EU, Germany and the US want to engage Iran? And I mean, what is the goal of, of our engagement? I mean, these are basically the questions which we will have to clarify and which uh, right now, at this point in time, and for the past, yeah, you could say at least year or two years, have been rather a policy of divergence than cooperation, because from a German point of view, and particularly also from a German social democratic point of view, as you might know, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation is a social democratic political foundation, the engagement of Iran with the goal of keeping it from building nuclear capacities, doing, together, doing that together with the United States of America was one of, we considered a big political success and a very difficult one, uh, where a lot of political energy and uh, efforts were, were, were made in Geneva in the negotiations. Uh, the negotiations were led by Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who is now the president of Germany. And he personally invested, together with Secretary Kerry, a lot of political capital into this agreement. And we considered it 
to be really the biggest success we had as a transatlantic um, policy to, on the one hand, engage Iran, but also to have a, a, a policy of containment, to combine that. And I mean, this is, I think, a really uh, the art of diplomacy, to combine containment and engagement. And we, of course, I'm, it will not surprise you, would like to see a path back towards such a policy. And we are rather skeptical that the policy of maximum pressure will lead to positive results for our relationship with Iran, but also for the region, which is obviously a very troubled region and is very close to Europe and brings us um, many challenges, to put it mildly. And we are, of course, worried if we, if, if the, if we have a more disruptive situation in Iran and in the region, that this will lead also to disruptions in Europe, which will then again have also political consequences. And this can be discussed probably at another discussion, but this is what we are talking about. So we are very happy that today we can discuss uh, this report, which was being produced by uh, the Friedrich Ewald Foundation, one of the initiators, David Javilwand, is here. He came from Berlin, to, and I'm glad that we, we have the possibility to discuss this with our American colleagues. And as I said before, I really hope that in this triangle cooperation, we can move forward and do more in the coming year, maybe even years, and create, well, poly positive forward-looking policy traditions that will move our relationship with Iran forward so that we have more security on the one hand and maybe in the, in the long run also a freer and more prosperous Iran and also something very important of course that it will be uh, beneficial for the United States and the European Union at the same time. So I leave it there and I hope that this discussion will, will give us some ideas where we want to go, what are the problems, what are the obstacles, but what are also the possibilities. So thank you very much for being here with us this morning, and I'll leave it now to the panel to start the discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here um, for this, uh, what I imagine will be a great discussion. Um, I'm Nargis Bajorli. I'm an assistant professor at SAIS, School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, my focus is on Iran. Um, so I was very happy when uh, Barbara asked me to be here uh, moderating this panel. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, to you all. The first uh, to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Ja uh, uh, David Jalilvand, who is a Berlin-based analyst and consultant. His work focuses on the interplay of energy and international politics in Iran and the Middle East. Um, between 2015 to 2018, he led the Iran program at the Frederick Ebert Foundation in Berlin, and he earned his PhD in political science from the Free University of Berlin in 2016 with a dissertation on the energy sector, politics, and economy on Iran. Uh, he's also one of the co-editors of this, um, the report that came out. Um, the second person to speak will be Dr. Kenneth uh, Katzman, who's a specialist with the Congressional Research Service. He served as a senior Middle East analyst for the U.S. Congress with special emphasis on Iran, the Persian Gulf states, Afghanistan, and Iran-backed groups operating in the Middle East and South Asia. He provides reports and briefings to members of Congress and their staff on U.S. policy. And then, uh, last but definitely not least, is uh, Barbara Slavin, who is the director here of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Um, she is also a columnist for almonitor.com, a website devoted to news from and about the Middle East. She's the author of the book, Bitter Friends, Bossom Enemies, Iran, the US, and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. And she's a regular commentator on, uh, on uh, Iran and on US foreign policy on NPR, PBS, and C-SPAN. And up until um, 
coming here at the Atlanta Council, she was a career journalist, and I know many of you are familiar with her work for a very long time. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Jadid Vand, who will take it from here. <coughs> Thank you so much, Nigel. Yep. Many thanks to the Atlantic Council and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for hosting this timely event and for having us. Um, I begin perhaps by uh, saying a few general words about the publication um, and to present some key findings from it. Um, so the Ebert Stiftung asked me and I helped put together this report to zoom out for a moment and go beyond the hectic cycle of breaking news with respect to Iran and to try to make an attempt to assess the more longer-term implications of the U.S. maximum pressure campaign against Iran. To this end, we assembled a team of five renowned experts um, uh, who discussed different dimensions uh, to this question. Azadeh Zamirirat, who was supposed to be with us today, actually, but couldn't unfortunately travel due to health reasons, uh, made a contribution on uh, the impact of sanctions on Iran's domestic sphere, Bijan Khajipur discussing the Iranian economy, Rus Parsi, Iran's regional policy, Barbara Slevin, who will speak in a moment, I assume, on US policy towards Iran, and last but not least, Adnan Tabatabai, who discusses European-Iranian relations. Um, there are many interesting uh, observations in the report, but uh, two, in my view, stand out, and I'm going to discuss them in the following. The first is a rather obvious observation, but still uh, as obvious as the observation is, I think it needs to be highlighted and underlined. And this is the fact that uh, a year of maximum pressure has not brought Iran anywhere closer towards meeting any of the 12 demands that were put forward by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. To the contrary, Iran has reduced uh, its compliance under the nuclear deal, the JCPOA. It entertained a much more bellicose and aggressive policy in the Middle East. And as such, uh, we conclude that maximum pressure as Iran has moved Iran uh, more away from meeting the 12 demands rather than, than uh, making progress towards realizing an agreement uh, uh, in between. Um, the second observation is perhaps not so obvious, but I think it's very important. And this is the observation that the impact of sanctions on Iran is much bigger in the realm of politics than in the realm of the economy. And this might be surprising if we look at the fact that Iran's GDP is facing contraction, uh, if we look at Iran's oil exports plummeting, having plummeted already, if we look at inflation in Iran, if we look at the fact that purchasing power of households has decreased dramatically, which has fed into the frustration, the socio-economic, socio-political frustration that found then an uh, expression in the form of the protests that we saw over the past weeks, protests that were met with extreme harsh repression on the part of the Islamic Republic, um, ex repression to an extent that we didn't see uh, before in Iran. Uh, but still, with respect to the economy, on the whole, the broader trajectory of the Iranian economy remains unchanged. Iran continues efforts to extend the value chain in oil and gas to create backward and forward linkages. Iran continues its efforts on economic diversification, on the enhancement of local capabilities. And here, sanctions might perhaps slow this process, but it doesn't change the trajectory of the Iranian economy. This is different, fundamentally different, when it comes to the politics of Iran. Here, sanctions are really changing uh, the dynamics inside uh, the country. And this is, even though this is perhaps a bit too simplistic, but ever since um, uh, uh, the 1979 revolution in Iran, there was a debate uh, between uh, policymakers in Iran whether or not the Islamic Republic could or could not one day find a modus vivendi with the United States. And the camp that has argued that one day uh, the Islamic Republic and the United States will be able to settle their differences. They make an agreement and they make other agreements on top of that. And in, in Iran, there was a debate about the Barajama Do and say about the next JCPOAs, if you want. Um, the camp that argued that engagement is possible has essentially nothing to show for, whereas those who always argued that the United States cannot be trusted and that it's impossible to make a deal with the Americans are now seeing their hands strengthened. Um, this is one key conclusion that uh, uh, Iran took away uh, from uh, the 18 months since the US withdrawal from the JCPOA. Um, a second observation in this uh, uh, realm, and Azadeh discusses this greatly in her <coughs> contribution, um, there's also growing dissatisfaction with the role of the Europeans. Um, Europe was either unable or unwilling or both to mitigate, to meaningfully mitigate uh, the damage that has been inflicted by the US sanctions. And uh, despite the fact that Europe committed and continues to be committed to the JCPOA and has announced steps in the direction of 
at least protecting parts of the European Iranian trade. But increasingly, uh, frustration grew in Iran with the European inability to sustain at least a significant minimum level of, of uh, trade between both sides, which has rendered the European position largely irrelevant uh, to, the, to the Iranians. And the third takeaway, um, which feeds into the broader ob observation that the harm on politics is bigger than on the economy, is that Iranian decision makers arrived at the conclusion that confrontation yields better results for them than cooperation. Remember between May 8th and 2018 and May 8th, 2019, exactly one year, Iranian, Iran entertained a uh, uh, strategy that was referred to by Iranian officials as strategic patience. Iran remained in full compliance with the nuclear deal in the hope that Europe would take steps to sustain a minimum level of European-Iranian trade and to ensure that a minimum economic interest uh, of Iran would be protected uh, under the JCPOA. Um, having lost confidence in the European ability or willingness to, to act in this direction, Iran's changed its policy in May this year and entertained a much more assertive uh, uh, approach, an approach that uh, has resulted in a continuous reduction of commitments under the JCPOA. Uh, Iran is reducing compliance and is likely to continue to do so in January. Um, and in the regional arena, especially around the Persian Gulf, Iran has entertained a much more bellicose approach and we saw the attacks against oil tankers, infrastructure and so on uh, this summer. Uh, and why are Iranians convinced that confrontation yields better results than cooperation? Twelve months of strategic patience has only resulted in a further deterioration of the Iranian economic position, whereas a few weeks of a more assertive uh, approach uh, has moved things in the direction of Tehran. The United States showed that at least at this stage they are not prepared to militarily confront Iran and the shooting down of the US drone would have given the Americans the casus belli to act against Iran. The Emiratis have changed policies big times, withdrawing the bulk of their troops from Yemen, dispatching a number of delegations to Tehran for security talks, uh, easing restrictions uh, for Iranian business and trade in Dubai, including the release of assets, and uh, this fall entertaining an, an approach that calls for a bigger deal with the Americans. And the Emirati foreign minister went as far as in an op-ed with the FT to suggest that Iran and the Emirates could be best of friends. The Saudis uh, have moved as well. Uh, rumors have it that they reached out to, to Tehran via Iraqi Prime Minister Abdel Mahdi a few weeks ago. They've fast-tracked negotiation efforts with the Houthis to overcome uh, at least a part of the Yemen uh, conflict. And recently we learned that the Americans no longer think that the Houthis are Iranian proxies, which is an interesting observation from Europe. Um, and as far as Europe is concerned, despite clear violations of the JCPOA on the part of Iran, um, the Europeans have not triggered the dispute resolution mechanism under the JCPOA, which could result in the reimposition of both the European Union and United Nations sanctions. So with these three observations, that agreements with the Americans are not sustainable, that the Europeans are not willing or able to mitigate damage from the sanctions, and that confrontation yields better results than cooperation, Iran walks away from the past 18 months. And looking ahead, this is a toxic melange. It is a toxic melange as we are facing parliamentary elections in Iran in 2021, uh, 2020 in a few months. We're facing presidential elections in Iran in May 2021, and most likely conservatives will win both elections. And even the moderates that are able to secure seats in the parliaments will entertain much more hardline, much more aggressive positions. Um, and on top of this, you have the succession question of the supreme leader looming. And most likely, the conservatives are not only controlling the unelected institutions of the Islamic Republic, but also the elected at the time when the next supreme leader will be chosen. And on top of that, they domestically have won the battle of ideas, if you want, as to where the future of the Islamic Republic is. Is it in cooperation uh, with the West or more in confrontation? Um, so maximum pressure, and I, by, by this I would like to conclude, has pushed Iran to a much more assertive uh, position for the months and years to come. I thank you and look forward to your question and the discussion. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Katz. Thank Ooh, you Katz very on. much uh, to the Atlantic Council. Uh, glad to be here. I, uh, I am in a CRS capacity this morning. Uh, however, of course, CRS does not take positions on any issues such as Iran, so, but I am in a CRS capacity. Uh, <coughs> so obviously, uh, it has to, my presentation has to be very objective and fact-based. Uh, 
What I'd like to talk about today a little bit is the term working, when we say a U.S. policy is working or not. Working is a very broad term. A, a, a policy can work to affect some variables, and it cannot work to affect other variables. It can work to affect some variables, but perhaps not in ways that uh, the U.S. desires or, or achieves a strategic outcome. And I think uh, Dr. David's presentation got into a little of that. So when the administration says its policy of maximum pressure is working, I think uh, what I'd like to do for a few minutes is just dissect that, that, and th that uh, assertion a little bit. Um, and actually, I would say we're not actually one year into the maximum pressure campaign. We are one year into the reimposition of all U.S. secondary sanctions. I actually date the maximum pressure campaign to May of this year when the United States ended the exception for the purchase of Iranian oil. Uh, until May, uh, <clears throat> under the previous set of sanctions, when Mr. Obama was president, a, a, a country could be exempt if they reduced their purchases of Iranian oil. And, and by allowing those exceptions, Iran was still exporting about 1.1 million barrels a day which is less than their normal. Their baseline is about two and a half million barrels a day of exports, but it was enough to, it was sustainable. The, re, the, the withdrawal of these sanctions exceptions in May, however, has driven Iran's oil exports to approximately 250,000 to 300,000 barrels a day, which uh, in the Iranian uh, economic system is uh, not sustainable and obviously not healthy. Uh, in terms of their economy. So again, to break down this term working, the way I interpret the, uh, the concept of is U.S. policy working is, is Iran accepting, acceding to, willing to negotiate on any of the 12 demands set out by Secretary Pompeo last uh, May, May of 2018? which is basically, a, basically an end to Iran's civilian nuclear program, an end to its development of nuclear-capable ballistic missiles, a virtual withdrawal of Iranian influence in the region, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, <coughs> Bahrain, uh, Lebanon, obviously, almost a complete rollback of Iranian influence. Uh, and, and there was a, a bullet point, I believe, on, on a releasing dual nationals. We did, we did have one released uh, last uh, weekend, uh, you know, under, under a swap. The, th the, thesis, the thesis of the administration policy is that if you produce an intermediate effect, economic decline, you will get the strategic outcomes of Iran acceding to the 12 demands. That's, that's the thesis. Now, my analysis is, <coughs> the administration policy has achieved that intermediate effect of weakening Iran's economy and, and producing political, uh, some political unrest, uh, you know, although we can debate, you know, in 2017, there, were, uh, there was a big, there was an uprising in 100 cities also, and the sanctions were in a state of being lifted in 2017. And now there was unrest, the sanctions are back in. So the connection to sanctions, I think, is arguable. Uh, and 2009, of course, the Green Uprising, there were virtually no U.S. secondary sanctions in place at that time. So uh, I'm a little skeptical of the connection between U.S. sanctions and unrest, but we can, we can discuss that in the Q&A. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the maximum pressure has clearly damaged Iran's economy. I think that's incontroversial, incontrovertible. The IMF said, Iran's economy will shrink about 9.5% this year till the uh, next no ruse next March. Um, you know, as I said, the oil exports are way down. Uh, we, we can debate the unrest, but still, uh, obviously, uh, Iran's economy is struggling. I mean, I don't think there's any real way to, to debate that. However, the, the, economic, the, the production of, of this intermediate effect of an, in, of an economic decline has not produced the strategic breakthrough, a strategic benefit of Iran's accession to the 12, the 12 main U.S. demands, which would be 
a, a very dramatic change in behavior uh, of, of Iran, particularly in the region. And I think of the 12 demands, I think eight or nine of them refer to Iran and the region, and the other four are proliferation and, and other, other relationships. Um, so Iran has begun, as Dr. David said, to, to lash back. Obviously, we had the September 14th attack on Iran's, uh, on Saudi's critical uh, oil infrastructure, uh, which is interesting because the administration is asserting that the maximum pressure campaign is quote unquote working. Well, if it's working, then you would assume that Iran would not be able to conduct a strategic attack like that. You would assume that Iran is not able to build uh, the defensive capabilities and work on its drones, its torpedoes, its short-range ballistic missiles, its guidance systems. Yet the Defense Intelligence Com uh, Agency just came out with its annual military rep uh, power report on Iran just two weeks ago, which said Iran is working on all of these things and, and indeed achieving dramatic breakthroughs on many of these things. So if if the policy is, is quote unquote working, one would expect Iran to be doing less of these things or less capable. But, but uh, not only DIA, but General McKenzie, the CENTCOM commander, uh, he said virtually the same thing. Uh, Iran is in position to attack. They may be preparing to attack. Uh, he said before the Manama Dialogue, which is a big, highly touted strategic strategy conference in Bahrain each year, uh, he said w his, his view is the U.S. has deterred an Iranian attack on U.S. forces, but not on the Gulf states. So again, if, if maximum pressure is, is quote unquote working, then uh, in my view, we would uh, assume that Iran is strategically getting weaker, but the U.S. defense officials and these reports indicate Iran is getting progressively strategically stronger. So I think we have to, we have to look at that. Now, the, the last point is the U.S. policy could quote unquote work if Iran comes to the table and begins negotiating concessions on, on these 12 demands. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for as an analyst. Is Iran willing to come to the table? Well, yes, Rouhani seems to he said again last weekend, they're willing under some circumstances to come to the table. The issue is, are they willing to come to the table and make any dramatic concessions on the key strategic objectives the United States wants to achieve? And that I have yet to see evidence uh, that they're willing to compromise on any of their major strategic goals. Um, there is some evidence that they might be willing to talk about medium or longer range ballistic missiles. However, what's interesting is it, it is the shorter range ballistic missiles that are, is allowing Iran to project power in the region, not the longer range missiles. So even if Iran theoretically were to negotiate away longer range missiles, the core of their ability to project power in the region is the short range uh, ballistic missiles and the cruise missiles, which they, there is no indication that Iran is willing to do any less research or any less work or make any concessions on these shorter range systems. So these are some of the issues I'm following and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barbara, please. Um, thank you, I don't know, you know, a lot has been said already. First, I wanna thank you, Nargis, for yeah, coming. Of course. For those of you who don't know, uh, Nargis has written an amazing book which focuses on the media strategies of Iran's hardliners and it's reframing Iran? Iran reframed. Iran reframed. Yeah. Um, to understand the power structure <clears throat> in the country now and the power structure which is being strengthened by US policy, I highly recommend <clears throat> this book. Thank um, you. you know, look, I have to admit a bias. Uh, as, as Stu Eisenstadt mentioned, we worked very hard on the JCPOA and a lot of us thought that it had potential, that it was not just a nuclear agreement, but it represented the first success, the first achievement for US Iran diplomacy, direct diplomacy at a high level. Uh, and it was an experiment, I think, on the part of the Iranians, a test case. Uh, and unfortunately, it was not given the opportunity to really be tested because uh, nine months after it went into full implementation, Donald Trump was elected and everyone knew his attitude toward the JCPOA, that it was the worst deal ever negotiated and that he was going to find a way to leave it. Um, the fact that he remained technically 
uh, U.S. remained technically in compliance with it uh, for more than a year was actually rather surprising. Mm -hmm. um, I had thought that the U.S. would leave it sooner than it did. Um, but what, when we look at U.S. policy, uh, you know, we have to understand that from the, the point of view of the Iranians and Europeans, um, there's a lot of confusion over what the goal actually is. And uh, yes, we have the 12 demands, but we've had a number of other statements uh, coming from U.S. officials uh, and from President Trump, most especially himself through tweets and other comments that cast doubt over what the goal is. Um, we've also seen uh, a flurry of statements since the protests began in Iran that suggested that the U.S. was essentially encouraging the protesters to overthrow the Iranian government. When you have a situation where an adversary is arguing for the overthrow of your government, it makes it a little bit difficult, if not impossible, for such a government to even consider concessions um, because its very existence is at stake. And so instead of concessions, we've seen, we've seen the reverse. Um, you know, some of the, the, the statements that have been made have, have really been confusing. Um, uh, the <coughs> vice president gave a big speech in Warsaw. The U U.S. organized a, an Iran bashing conference in Warsaw uh, last February, where Pence basically told the Europeans to get out of the JCPOA. But then there have been others who said, no, you should, they want Iran to stay because they don't want it to accelerate its nuclear program more rapidly. So what is a U.S. policy? We've also had um, an extraordinary bureaucratic merry-go-round. Uh, four national security advisors, two secretaries of state, just in the first term of an American president. We've never seen this kind of, of, this kind of turnaround. Um, and that has also caused confusion. And then uh, just a, a, a word on the, the whole question of sanctions. Sanctions have always been the sort of default position of the U.S. government toward Iran, uh, going back to the hostage crisis, going back to, to 1979. Um, there, it's considered a somewhat risk-free policy. It doesn't put U.S. troops in, in jeopardy. Um, but I think it's become a mindless policy uh, that is cruel and counterproductive in the case of many countries, not just Iran. And we can talk about Cuba or Venezuela or North Korea. The, those who suffer are primarily ordinary citizens. <clears throat> and we've done a number of events here at the Council. We've talked about the impact on medical supplies to Iran, people who can't get cancer medication, who can't get uh, devices that they need for other rare diseases and conditions because of the uh, U.S. dominance of the uh, financial sector. The sanctions on Iranian banks have, have effectively prevented many companies in Europe and elsewhere from providing desperately needed medicine and medical supplies, even though these items are not supposed to be sanctioned under U.S. law. Um, so I think it's been um, hypocritical, to say the least, when you hear administration officials talk about how these things are not sanctioned. Effectively, they are. The other thing is the growth of what we call the sanctions industry. Um, this has happened since 9-11, uh, when the US Treasury Department realized that, again, this control of, over the financial sector, the role of the dollar, was a tremendously effective weapon, if used wisely, against terrorism and terrorism financing. But it has become truly an industry. There are thousands of people just in this town let alone around the world, uh, former government officials, many of them, lawyers, many of them, who specialize in areas of sanctions compliance. There are so-called think tanks um, in town uh, that are really lobby shops for sanctions and that come up with long lists of additional things to sanction. Uh, but what we've discovered is that the US is running out of things to sanction against Iran. Just yesterday, the State Department has sanctioned yet again two yes. entities that have already been sanctioned repeatedly, the Iranian shipping lines and, and Mahan Air. I'm not quite sure what announcing it again means, but to my mind, that's not exactly going to produce any <coughs> new, new uh, results. And finally, one point about Europe and this whole question of whether Europe will snap back sanctions. One thing we have learned about sanctions over, over the last 40 odd years is that they only work 
when we have maximum multinational support for them and when the goals are clear. So they worked in the case of South Africa. They worked under the Obama administration because the goal was a negotiating process that was realistic, that would involve concessions on all sides, and because the European Union, in addition to the United Nations Security Council, blessed these sanctions, particularly on Iranian oil. That's why Iran came to the table. That's why Iran negotiated the JCPOA. It was certainly one of the major reasons. We do not have those conditions now. Instead, as uh, Newt pointed out, we have a divergence of US and European policy. Uh, the Europeans, many European companies are not in Iran because they're afraid of American sanctions, but that doesn't mean that they're complying willingly. And so, to my mind, this policy is bound to backfire because it doesn't meet the, the basic minimum standards for a successful uh, sanctions policy. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but I would love to hear actually from our moderator her, her point of view because I think she's, she's written very eloquently about the, the impact on Iran internally, which is something we need to be very aware of. You know, the enemy gets a vote, as, as many people like to say. Yeah, thank you all. These are um, really excellent comments. I, so I'll, um, I'll couch my question in, in sort of a broader comment as, as I saw that what the, the three of you were saying um, about maximum pressure in the long term for Iran. So we've been focusing a lot in this discussion about sanctions, but maximum pressure obviously is not just sanctions, right? It's, it's also covert actions, it's also cyber warfare, it's also uh, media disinformation campaigns. And so part of, I think, one of the ways of potentially understanding how Iran is responding and or what the long-term consequences will be within the country is understanding that in this atmosphere that maximum pressure has created, which in effect the Islamic Republic feels that it is under war, um, or at least sort of cornered in a position where it really doesn't have any you know, what, what are its options? Because what it sees at stake, as Barbara just said, it's the very survival of the entire system. Um, so in that, in this scenario that we are now in today, um, including the fact that much of the leadership of the Islamic Republic has been sanctioned so heavily that in essence, it's unlike, you know, the Shah, when, when, the, when the pressures of the revolutionary movement got so intense, eventually he boarded a plane and he left the country. The supreme leader and the leadership of the Islamic Republic cannot board any plane and go anywhere. So part of what that means is you are entrenching power so incredibly deeply within Iran that when you are cornering the system in the way that we have through maximum pressure and in addition including very viable reasons for uprisings in Iran because people are so incredibly frustrated with the political situation, the economic situation, long-term corruption in the country, in this entire um, terrain that we now have, when there are uprisings like we just saw, the Islamic Republic, because of what David mentioned, that, that maximum pressure has, in a sense, vindicated the hardliners by saying, we told you so, you cannot trust the US, right? So in that, in, in that scenario, they now, especially the hardliners within the Revolutionary Guard, have started to take more and more power within Iran. I mean, one thing as an aside, sort of opening a tangent here really quickly, what I find, I studied the Revolutionary Guard for many years, and what I find very fascinating is in DC, people think that the Revolutionary Guard has already gained, you know, Revolutionary Guard already had a lot of power in Iran. The types of forces that are being empowered today in Iran in the Revolutionary Guard are not the types of forces that have been wielding power within, this, within the state establishment. And we are beginning to see what that might look like. And part of that was the crackdown that we saw with the protesters. Because you now have a set within the Revolutionary Guard who their entire framework of understanding international politics, especially very recently, comes from understanding um, the fights in Syria and Iraq against ISIS and in general wider geopolitical uh, uh, battles that go on vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the United States when it comes to a weakened Iran. So you now have those folks who saw battle, not only saw battle but were actively engaged in battle in Syria and Iraq, now understanding that Iran is under pressure in such a way where it, where it's um, is, is against 
it's, a, it's about the survival of them as a system. And so they will react in the same way that they thought they had to react in Syria and, and Iraq when it came to questions of ISIS and larger sort of um, geopolitical maneuverings that were happening there. So those are the folks who are beginning to gain power within the Revolutionary Guard in Iran. Now my question then is, in, in this um, in this environment in which we, the Iranian state is cornered to the extent that it is, um, it first means potentially that any kind of resistance from the ground up in Iran, because there, there as you said, Dr. Katzman, there's been many instances of, of revolt in Iran over the past 10 years. Um, did you? I just want to put, uh, yeah. can, can I just say, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I disagree that they're cornered. Uh, I, I see Iran as actually stronger strategically in the region than I have ever seen them at any time since the revolution in terms of the sweep of their influence in the region. Mm -hmm. they, and, and this is the key to why I think the UAE is visiting them, why Saudi Arabia is visiting them, because, and why Mr. perhaps Mr. Trump has not pulled the trigger on retaliating because they can now, they're, because of what, because of their proxies, because of their mm -hmm. alliances, they can cause so much damage right. in the region and so much havoc right. that everybody is deterred. So I, I, I'm pushing back on the idea that I they're cornered. I agree with you, but I think that's their insurance policy. And they've built it over these years as their insurance policy, you know. Um, so. I think what the what the situation is doing, though, is and 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 then I guess this is my question to you all: um, Where, what if the goal of maximum pressure against Iran is not the twelve demands made by the Secretary of State Pompeo, but instead either a weakened Iran or regime change? Um, and where does that then? What we know that the Islamic Republic is not going to concede on any of those demands, at least as it's laid out today. Um, so what realistically, if, as David, you mentioned, the conservatives begin to take more power politically within the country, what is the realistic outcome of the next, let's just say, five years down the road uh, when it comes to domestic, regional, again, going back to Dr. Katzman about the regional policies, and then vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Well. Studying the Middle East, uh, I arrived at the conclusion never to make yes. any predictions no, for <laughs> a year, let alone five years. Uh, so future will tell. Uh, though um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Iran is on a path to entertain a much more assertive approach, mm -hmm. as it has arrived at the conclusion that it can defend its interest, its interest in regime survival, best by projecting power in the region. Um, the very general idea behind that, the idea to create strategic depth in the region vis-a-vis uh, -vis being militarily inferior to the United States, to Israel, to others, I mean, this goes <laughs> long uh, ago and predates maximum pressure uh, by yeah. decades. Uh, still, maximum pressure has shown to the Iranian leadership that actually, uh, in order to protect the, the system itself, uh, it needs to be able to hit back against potential adversaries uh, in other parts uh, of the region, uh, be it uh, Israel via Hezbollah, be it uh, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula via proxies uh, uh, in, in Iraq, be it uh, through missiles uh, directly at the disposal of, of Iran. And this logic will not be changed, and, and here I'm, I'm, I'm very much with Ken Katzman, Sanctions advocates have oftentimes argued that, that now Iran has less funds uh, at its disposal and now it can uh, spend less on the region. Uh, though the Iranian engagement in the region is quite low cost, according to US government figures, uh, I think 16 billion over the past years, which translates to some two to three billion per year, which is, well, it's not, not, a, not nothing, but it's, it's, it's nothing if you compare it to the uh, defense spending of the United States, of uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Iran's regional allies. And if you contrast that to a pre-sanctions GDP of around 400 billion, um, then even under economic pressure and with the perception uh, that uh, the United States are trying to weaken the foundations of the system, uh, then certainly Iran will not cut spending uh, on its activities in the region. And add to that, uh, and, and Ruzba Parsi uh, nicely discusses this in our report, um, uh, it also assumes that the, the only link between Iran and its proxies is a financial transaction. Um, whereas, in fact, with, the who, uh, with, the, with Hezbollah in Lebanon, with various Shiite groups in Iraq, and even to the extent that there are links with the Houthis in, in Yemen, there are also ideological links that, that bound 
the, the proxies, the, the non-state actors, if you, if you want, and Iran together. And uh, so, yes, there might be implications of Iran having less financial means at its disposal, uh, but this doesn't mean that the, the link between Iran and these non-state actors will be lastingly weakened. <coughs> and this, is, I think, is a, a key misperception also of, of uh, the advocates of maximum pressure. And a very simple look into the recent history. I mean, Iran stepped up its engagement in Syria in 2011 and all afterwards, at a time when European Union, US sanctions started to kick in against the country. So parallel to the increase of sanctions against Iran, mm -hmm. Iran stepped up its uh, uh, position in the region, and, and this will continue. With respect to uh, whether or not uh, a negotiated outcome can still be realized between Iran and the United States, there's a bit of optimism, but much pessimism. I mean, the, the, the most recent optimism, I would say, is the recent prisoner swap. I mean, that was a negotiated outcome, and I think the... Uh, yes, but the change in, uh, from Bolton to O'Brien certainly f path the, uh, f facilitated the way uh, for, for this exchange to happen. And perhaps if both sides manage it smartly, uh, they can, can build on this and exchange more prisoners that are unjustly held. Um, uh, Iran has expressed that it's generally prepared to, to engage in multilateral fora, not bilateral uh, negotiations with the Americans, but as part of uh, a multilateral effort, whatever that means in practical steps. And parts of what ir Iran is doing at the moment is not just to inflict a price tag for the advocates of maximum pressure in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi and to show their vulnerabilities, but also to build leverage for future negotiations. That is the, the optimism part of the equation. Um, uh, the, the pessimism uh, part of the equation is that um, the timing is terrible. Um, you have a cycle of elections in Iran in 2020, 2021. You have uh, presidential elections in the States in 2020. You have impeachment in the room. Uh, so uh, a lot of factors that don't necessarily suggest that both sides are prepared to make deep concessions, um, concessions that go beyond the concessions that both sides made during the JCPOA. So there's, there's a bit of optimism, but on the whole, uh, I'd be skeptical <coughs> that a solution or a breakthrough could be realized uh, in the months ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to broaden this out to, to a sort of you know, more global geopolitical discussion. You know, one of the debates in Iran, yes, was whether there could be reconciliation with the United States. Another debate has been whether Iran should look east or west, whether it should uh, focus on Asia and Russia, whether it should adopt um, a, an even more authoritarian political model while perhaps giving more social freedoms uh, in the country. And I think that if we look at the new generation of hardliners coming up, that one can see a sort of concept of uh, the China model, you know, which I think Ahmadinejad popularized a decade ago, where, yes, the young people can have their rap music and the women's scarves can fall back, um, but there will be almost zero political expression and uh, heavy censorship and an intranet uh, and limited access to, to, the, to the world. This kind of model, which I'm afraid is really going to gain there, um, because the West has failed Iran, because the West has not lived up to its commitments under the JCPOA, and because the generation that negotiated this deal will be pushed from power. These are individuals who got their education primarily in the West, Rouhani, Zarif. Uh, we used to joke that there were more American PhDs on Zarif's uh, negotiating team than there were on the American negotiating team during the JCPOA. Yeah. So, you know, now we'll get people who perhaps uh, studied in Moscow or who certainly uh, came to power through the Iran-Iraq war or through their activities uh, fighting not just ISIS but killing Syrians uh, and Iraqis uh, in Syria uh, and, and Iraq during the U.S. invasion of Iraq, going after Sunnis and dissident Shia, and in Syria uh, killing Sunnis uh, that uh, were rising up against the Assad regime. Um, the hard men of the regime mm -hmm. are, are the ones who may be taking over. And the window for this kind of grand reconciliation that many of us have talked about and hoped for uh, may be closing for quite a long time. Yeah. That's the pessimistic side. The optimistic side, which I can't give up, there are still people who, in Iran, and I just read something by uh, Ziba, um, Kalam. Kalam, Ziba Kalam, professor, reformist, who still think that Iranians want Western freedoms, want more democracy, um, and that if they are given any chance to express that they will, 
you know, I always say that when you give Iran, Iranians lemons, they make lemonade, they pick the most progressive candidate they can find to vote for. And that somehow, if the, if the posture of the United States in particular changes, if, we, if our bellicosity is reduced, if the U.S. is more reasonable in some way, if Donald Trump is not reelected or if he somehow sees the light, you know, that this will have an impact on Iranian internal politics. So I'm not willing to give up on Iran um, and its, its prospects for peaceful reform. And I think that should, be, that should be a goal of American policy. And unfortunately, maximum pressure is, is accomplishing the reverse. I don't, I don't have that much to add. I mean, I, I would be a little more optimistic in terms of, you know, obviously this town runs on interests and there's a lot of advertising and I'm not going to get too deep into it because that we can do two days of retreat on the whole issue of how this town works. But <laughs> um, <laughs> fair to say that this, what, op, what makes me a little more optimistic is the Saudi and UAE shift a little bit because I think this summer really scared these two, really scared them that Iran is going to attack. Iran has become very powerful. I talked a little about that earlier. The cruise missiles, the short-range ballistic missiles, the precision-guided missiles. Israel is bombing in Syria quite frequently because of this threat to try to neutralize it in some way. I think this, this near collision that we had this past summer really scared the Saudis and UAE that they're very vulnerable, uh, that they could theoretically be alone in some sort of a conflict uh, with Iran, which they would not win. Uh, and they would be, all the investment that they try to attract, all the tourism they try to attract would be out the window in such a conflict. Refugee flows, business downturn, a ramp goes just gone public, that could have been soured. And I think they've shifted, uh, maybe markedly, and, and perhaps they're going to mute their uh, agitation uh, about the Islamic Republic. And that, that could cause some rethink here. It could cause some trimming of sales here. We'll have to see. But, but I'm a little more optimistic on that. I'll open it up to the floor um, for questions. Okay, great. I'll start from the back and move forward, please. Yes. Yeah. With the glasses, you just, yeah. Good morning, and thank you very much for a very interesting panel. I'm Charlie Bo from, from the Washington Institute. I'm a visiting fellow. Um, my question is about the process that could lead to this negotiated outcome. Yeah. Uh, we've seen at the Yunga in September that some kind of theater and <laughs> high leadership uh, moves could bring something close to the the negotiation but i think we'll all agree that this negotiation is so complex that uh, leaders cannot handle everything together or alone so how do you see um, or do you see a way to actually connect the different dimensions uh, you you talked about to actually have a process because right now the GCPOA track uh, still lives, but it's difficult, and we haven't found a way to actually design a package that would connect so-called regional issues, uh, ballistic missiles, and other issues related to Iran. So how do you see concretely uh, this diplomatic process moving forward? Yeah. Thank you. I'll take a stab at, at first at this. What the Iranians have been calling for is a ceasefire with the United States, under which the U.S. would provide some sanctions relief restore waivers, allow the Macron idea of the $15 billion credit for future oil delivery, something like that to go forward, in return for which Iran would stop uh, adding on more and more provocative steps, at least on the nuclear front, maybe roll some of them back. That's what the Iranians have been talking about. And there's actually um, an interesting piece on Al Monitor today about the sequencing of this, uh, where uh, you know Iran wanted President Trump to announce something, some sort of step, whether it was waivers for a year or two years before President Rouhani would agree to any contact with him at the United Nations. And 
and President Trump wouldn't do that. Um, this leads to a, a, a real domestic political question as far as I'm concerned. You know, what is, what is President Trump's priority now? Uh, and would any kind of ceasefire with Iran actually gain for him any support in his reelection campaign, which I think is, is the preeminent priority for him? His strongest supporters don't want to see an end to maximum pressure. They want more pressure. So I, I think that's why he balked at this kind of announcement. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, frankly, he's going to focus more on North Korea uh, because North Korea actually has nuclear weapons, unlike Iran. And I just, I don't, I don't see the ca capacity in the Trump administration for, for this kind of step. I hope I'm proved wrong. I don't know if anybody has a well, different I'm, view. Uh, negotiating uh, with Iran might might or might not help in the election, but getting into a war with Iran for the people that elected him, you know, that, that would be a, a problem. And I, I think that we have to say that that contributed to his hesitancy to respond this summer. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it, I, think, I think we're in a sort of a guessing game as far as what the administration might or might not do uh, for internal political reasons. Yeah, I can only underline uh, what the two of you said. The sequencing might be a way forward. As the Iranians say, precondition uh, for talks is the lifting of sanctions, and the Americans say full JCPOA compliance at the minimum level would be an opening door. Uh, and it's hard to realize both at the same time. So starting with waivers and then Iran gradually returning to JCPOA compliance in exchange for an increase of, of the waivers might be a way forward that could create room for talks. Still uh, looking till the end of next year, till the end of the presidential elections here in the States, um, one also would need to look at the substance of any potential new agreement. And here the question is really whether both sides are able, for domestic political reasons, to go beyond uh, what's in the JCPA. Um, and here I'm, I'm, I'm quite skeptical. Maybe a way forward would be to sign a new deal which has the contents of the JCPOA, but not Obama's or Kerry's signature on the right. Um, Maybe that's the way forward, but still, uh, here from the Iranian perspective, um, it would be also perhaps a bit foolish to make a bet that Trump will be re-elected uh, in 2020. So I guess uh, a lot of it will revolve around the wait and see where we stand at the end of next year, um, uh, and to then perhaps start an effort uh, with a new or the new Trump administration or a new incoming Democratic administration. Uh, yes, sir, and then. Hello, uh, my name is Maximilian Gerke. I'm a student from Germany, and uh, I've, I've, I have a question regarding the U uh, European stance, what they could do. Since we have a lot of interest in keeping the US-Iran conflict from escalating with the oil market, refugees, strong diaspora, and I'm wondering why the European Union and Germany and France and whatnot, why they um, cannot make insects work, for example. and since now six new countries have entered uh, INSTEX, whether that changes anything, and your, just your opinion, what, what the European role could be. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, in my reading, I'm very frank here, Europe has lost influence both towards Washington and Tehran. And this is due to a mismatch in the demands that have been articulated by the Europeans and the means uh, and steps that Europe was prepared to take. On the one hand side, Europe called on Washington uh, to grant waivers for European companies to continue trade with Iran, but wasn't prepared to back uh, that demand up with anything substantial that would have ultimately leveraged uh, Washington into granting these waivers. And the same towards Tehran, calling for a full, and, and rightly so, calling for full JCPOA compliance on the part of Iran, whereas one of the key Iranian interests in the deal, economic relief, uh, was not realized. Um, and as a result of this, at this stage, I would say, Europe is at the sidelines uh, of all dynamics surrounding the JCPOA. Still, that doesn't mean that Europe, there is nothing that Europe could do. Uh, getting INSTEX done uh, is something very, uh, that should be fast-tracked on the part of Europe. I mean, they narrowed down INSTEX starting from uh, ensure or arranging a, a mechanism that allows all legitimate trade with Iran to continue, legitimate from the point of view of the European Union and international law to uh, creating a humanitarian channel with Iran, which, uh, as far as I understand it, would be to totally in compliance with US sanctions. And even that, uh, Europe has not managed uh, to get started. Uh, so at this stage, uh, medicine and foodstuff can't be delivered to Iran. 
Um, and regardless of where one stands on the, on the sanctions and maximum pressure side of the equation, um, I guess uh, ensuring a uh, minimum level of access to, to foodstuffs and medicine should be something that everyone uh, should support. Um, Instax is understaffed at this point. Uh, the joining of, of six new countries might uh, increase uh, the institutional capabilities of Instax and we might or might not see the transactions anytime soon. Um, but still, this wouldn't certainly solve the entire equation. Uh, it wouldn't bring European-Iranian trade up to a level uh, that would satisfy the Iranians uh, uh, with respect to their expectations and demands uh, under the JCPOA. Um, so moving ahead, what could Europe do? Um, and, and here uh, we spoke already about US-Iran negotiations and certainly if, if uh, time is ripe, uh, Washington and Tehran will find back channels to negotiate their stuff. But at one point they will need to formalize it and here I don't think that both sides will be able to formalize these talks uh, as part of a bilateral uh, effort. Uh, and Europe, as before the JCPOA, could offer a multilateral forum for uh, the uh, Americans and Iranians uh, to, to move uh, forward. That is where I see uh, a European role in, in, in the months and weeks ahead. Yes. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I don't expect this to resonate with regime preservation folks. But we should also note that Hezbollah salaries are way down. They actually held a telethon this summer to try and raise some money. Uh, Houthi contributions are way down to the point that the Houthis seem willing to negotiate for the first time in years. And things couldn't be worse for the Shia militias in Iraq. So let's uh, at least acknowledge that data set. My question also is that uh, Europe promised us there would be snapback sanctions as soon as Iran broke it's part of the JCPOA. And in increasing U-235 enrichment, they did that. And there was not a single sanction snapped back. What exactly is the European promise to snap back sanctions? And how much uranium enrichment do you need before you actually take your promise seriously? Maybe Ken should talk about the militias. And, militia and you should no, I mean, the, the Saudis have basically lost the war in Yemen, so I, you know the Houthis negotiating doesn't really tell me much. Uh, Iraqi militias, I mean, there, there's been a response in Iraq to the Iraqi militias because they are so strong. Hadi Amiri, which is one of the key Ira uh, Iran-backed militia leaders, came in second in the national election in May. Uh, he was uh, basically an underground leader when Iran was trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein. So I don't necessarily see the Iraqi militias as, as materially weakened. Hezbollah is still in Syria. They have not retrenched yet. Uh, I mean, I hear these arguments about less money and Iran giving these militias and parties and proxies less money. But what I need to measure is have they retrenched have they reduced their operations? Have they stopped operating? Have they changed materially their stance on anything? And, and I, um, I have not seen that yet. As far as, as Europe and, and the sanctions snapback is concerned, um, well, in the first place, uh, over the summer of, of, of this year, uh, Europe held the position, in, in my assessment, uh, that Iran was not getting it, its end from the bargain, and, and as long as uh, Iran is reducing s only symbolically commitments under the JCPOA, increasing enrichment from 3.67 to 4.5 percent. That is something that Europe can live with. Uh, but increasingly, as Iran increases its campaign of, of reducing compliance under the JCPOA, this definitely raises the question as to when Europe should trigger the dispute resolution mechanism under the JCPOA. And this is a debate that is ongoing in European capitals at this moment. Uh, European E3 foreign ministers have raised uh, the threat of uh, triggering the DRM, um, which has its downside uh, attached to it uh, due to the fact that the dispute resolution mechanism is designed um, uh, to resolve a dispute. Um, whereas the way it's being introduced into the debate right now is more as a punitive means on the part of the European to punish Iran uh, for violating the JCPOA. Um, still, uh, there, is, there are off-roads once the DRM is triggered uh, to prevent the sanction snapback and to arrive at a negotiated conclusion. However, uh, anything in terms of substance that would be part of such a resolution could be discussed and negotiated already. 
Um, uh, so in my view, uh, once the DRM is triggered, we are in very, very uncertain waters with respect to the future of the JCPOA. Um, I don't know what, at the end of the day, the red lines for Europe would be. In, in my assessment, um, tempering with uh, access for uh, inspections would be a red line. Uh, if that is crossed, Europe would certainly trigger the DRM. Um, that is one thing where I think uh, we should see uh, a look at what's happening in, in January with respect to the DRM and Europe. I would like to pick up yeah. on, on the premise of his question, though, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, <laughs> the way that you, you uh, formulated it was that we want the Islamic Republic to stay. But I, I do want to say this, and I would like to pose this as a question to all of you, is that um, the, the maximum pressure, what it seems to be doing, is really, in for, like, any type of uprising, as we just saw f a few weeks ago, because of the way that the Islamic Republic understands its position right now, geopolitically and vis-a-vis -vis the United States, it has decided that it will crack down violently on any form of protest and do so in such a way in which body count doesn't matter to them, right? So then, if we're thinking about, okay, what happens Let's, let's take your, or, or sort of those who uh, think that maximum pressure will lead to regime change in Iran. Let's, let's play with that for a second and, and entertain that. So if maximum pressure is supposed to lead to regime change through making economic situation of Iranians so dire that they will then rise up against the system, well, what the Islamic Republic showed that it doesn't care how many people it kills to sustain the system. So then you are dealing with a situation in which you have one side that has a lot of arms and is extremely well uh, organized and the general population, which does not have very many arms. And even if arms are tried to be, you know, uh, sort of smuggled in through the borders, you're still coming up against a formal military, the Revolutionary Guard and all of its paramilitary forces. So then does that then lead to a Syria-like situation in which it is years of a potential civil war, which then kicks into refugee crises for Europe and all of these other things? Or do you see another way in which maximum pressure can lead to regime change without that sort of scenario? Just a short answer to that. Yeah. Uh, um, Europe has a long history in interfering in the Middle East and in establishing regimes, changing regimes. and. It wasn't necessarily for the good of the people uh, in that part of the world. So I don't know whether at all we should be in the business of changing regimes uh, at a normative level. Um, at a practical level, um, as an analyst and observer, I don't see any political movement in Iran or outside Iran that would be capable to replace the current regime and to improve the situation of the majority of Iranians inside the country. Um, you mean you don't take the former crown prince and the MEK seriously? Well, <laughs> judging from Europe, I don't <laughs> think that is a viable alternative, um, uh, uh, but we can discuss this. <laughs> um, on the other hand, certainly uh, uh, maximum pressure is uh, increasing economic hardship in Iran. It has added to the socioeconomic tensions that already existed before the sanctions came in. I mean, not, let not forget, Iran was confronted with protests and demonstrations time and again over the past years, oftentimes at uh, this, disparate places in the country now in 2017, 2018, we saw first nationwide protests, recently we saw protests. So it's nothing new, uh, economic hardship, social political grievances, repression from the state is nothing new in Iran. Um, uh, and, and certainly maximum pressure might add to this. But then again, as you mentioned, uh, uh, over the past weeks, uh, the regime showed that it's prepared to use uh, force against the people to an unprecedented uh, level. It has the ability to escalate tensions in the region. So I'm not seeing the end game here resulting in anything positive. So I don't see a clear <coughs> trajectory that would bring something good either for Iran or for the region in general. Regime change is not the stated goal of U.S. policy. I mean, I think we need to, uh, we need, you know, it is not the stated goal of U.S. policy. So, but if it were, uh, I would, two examples, Cuba and Venezuela. Yeah. Cuba being 90 miles from right. the United States of a period of over 60 years, the regime has not changed. Yeah. Venezuela being a, another country where we have very strict sanctions with the in apparent intent to change the regime. We have a lot of leverage in Venezuela, and still we have not changed the regime there. So 
I think we need to be very careful about regime, you know, sanctions and regime change being a goal of, of U.S. sanctions. Just, you know, I was a Soviet scholar I, in, in my youth, and the policy that, that got rid of the Soviet Union was congagement, as we call it here at the Atlantic Council, containment plus engagement. Uh, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, arose in a situation where there was detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. There were arms control treaties being negotiated. There were students going back and forth between the two countries. Uh, and Europe took a very favorable, Germany especially, very favorable attitude toward the Soviet Union so that there wasn't a sense that the country was under threat of imminent attack. When you change that situation, when, you, uh, when everything you do only intensifies the paranoia of the um, security forces in a country, when you have people in the State Department cheerleading the protests uh, as, as people are being mowed down in the streets, this doesn't create a conducive atmosphere for political change. It just creates a situation where you're likely to see more and more repression. Will the Islamic Republic disappear at some point? Of course it will. Um, but, you know, it's 40 years old, going on 41 years. Soviet Union lasted 70, right? So I think that the policies that the U.S. Uh, are, 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 are uh, implementing now, even if your goal is regime change, are completely counterproductive. They will not achieve that goal. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Saeed mm -hmm. I represent the American Computer Utopia Science and Technology Business Incubator. I thank the panel for an excellent discussion. This is what we need. I want to interject a positive posture that could change things, and also a question to see if that is possible on the part of intellectuals like you. Uh, Iranians, I know uh, over the several decades, uh, intellectuals and middle class have been extremely, those who have the knowledge, upset about the interference of the United States uh, in their democratic affairs at the time of Dr. Mossadegh and the uh, history of Kermit Roosevelt that with a limited budget overthrew the democratic regime in Iran. And uh, the suffering that has been imposed on the Iranian uh, nation, part of it stems from that misjudgment of the U.S. policy. So I know people talk about reparations to the American Indians in the Congress, you know, <laughs> uh, reparations for the uh, uh, Japanese that were encamped. Uh, how about intellectuals like you <laughs> coming up with an apology, writing a historical <laughs> apology on the part of the United States and the suffering that was imposed on the Iranians? All, <laughs> all this year and then saying, okay, because uh, without exception, Americans who go there, there have been some, you know, who have made uh, documentaries and so forth. They are received by Iranians with open arms. Uh, I know a few of the uh, documentary maker uh, personalities that went to Thank Iran. Thank you, you know. very much. Is, is, so your question so is my about question is reparations. Would, <laughs> would the intellectuals <laughs> make an intellectual reparation to the Iranians for interfering <laughs> in the, and the gentleman says. No, I think yeah. what we need is a reconciliation process where both countries admit how much they have hurt the other because Iran is hardly blameless uh, and, uh, in, in its activities toward the United States and toward those that supported by the United States. We have a lot to apologize for on both sides. So, you know, um, yeah, what do they call these things, the, the, these reconciliation? Truth, truth and reconciliation. Recon we need a truth and reconciliation <laughs> commission, but not reparations, in my view. So, you know, so <laughs> I'm going to, we only have a few more minutes, you but. Do you disagree with what the United States did to the Iranian democracy? I do, but I think, uh, I think that, uh, you so know, you realistically, from, from a Roosevelt. political point of view, your, your ideas is not going to fly in Washington. Yes, sir. Secretary Orban uh, did, uh, in 2000, acknowledge the U.S. role in Mossadegh. Mossadegh, yeah. It wasn't and the an Iran apology necessary in the Iran Iraq War, chem Saddam chemical weapons. It wasn't necessarily an apology, but it was, there was a process of 
acknowledging U.S. policy from the past, yes. Yes, sir. You mentioned the DIA uh, right. report, actually I read that one, and um, by the time that report came out, I don't think that the maximum pressure campaign has really has had any effect yet. I think, it, you know, throughout the process of writing the report, editing it, and then publishing that report, it took probably two months at least, or three months, as you said, that policy started to have effects in May. So really, Iran getting stronger is not, as a, not a result, a direct result of the um, you know, of, of the pressure campaign, but rather it's a continuous <laughs> pattern of improving their own indigenous military industry. That's number one. Number two, and I think, you know, what made the Iranians have a stronger political s stature is they're excellent brinkmanship politicians mm -hmm. rather than, you know, uh, rather than militaristic, you know. Uh, they, they, as you analyzed it, the, Trump could not really, uh, you know, strike back. He would have lost part of his base if he had done so, putting the U.S. you know on a collision course towards war with Iran. So um, I don't think the Iran the, the maximum pressure campaign, uh, contrary to your statement, unfortunately, uh, had made Iran any stronger. It had ma given them more chances to maneuver, you know, but not really made them any stronger militarily. And also the Saudis, uh, yes, at one point they tried, they attempted to talk to the Iranians, but they really didn't follow up on it. And Mehdi is already gone, the guy who tried to help them do so. So the other thing, the, the, in addition to all that, I think the Iraqi militias have lost a lot of ground in Iraq. By the way, I haven't introduced myself, I'm sorry. Um, I am a principal analyst uh, uh, with Accenture, iDefense, and I'm responsible for the Middle East. And before that, I was two-star general in the Iraqi army. And after that, I was a... Uh, a policy analyst, senior policy analyst with the Rand Corporation for seven years uh, covering the Middle East. Um, the thing is, uh, I don't think that brinkmanship, uh, I'm sorry, that, that policy of maximum pressure has yet matured enough to be evaluated. That's my bottom line. Somebody had told me a year ago that Iran could strike 19 targets in the two key Saudi oil processing facilities with that level of precision. I would have believed it either. No one would have believed yeah, it, that's exactly. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean that capacity was built in the last five months. Well, wait, but it hasn't been interrupted in the last five months either. I'm, uh, you, you, uh, I'm not saying maximum pressure, you know, made them stronger, but it has not clearly interrupted these defense programs that they obviously are still succeeding with. Yeah, the other Okay, so the maximum so pressure has not stopped the programs. We agree. So, so the, the maximum pressure has not really had any effect for the positive one and the two. Okay. So, why do we agree? We agree, yeah. It we didn't have make time them any for weaker. One more question, and then we will wrap up. So, um, so right there, and then that'll be it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ed Martin from the Center for Interfaith Engagement at Eastern Mennonite University. And the question I have, or maybe it's more st almost a statement, but it was said that the maximum pressure policy is certainly strengthening the hardliners in Iran and that they will probably take over in the upcoming presidential and uh, parliamentary elections. Um, and <coughs> it's also been said that regime change is not the goal of the U.S. administration. Well, I would... I'm certain that regime change is a goal of a number of people within the U.S. administration, and I wonder if seeing the Iranian government being dominated by hardliners and maybe some of the actions that they might take might be seen to justify interference from the outside, even though there's no possibility of internal regime change, but it might justify certain people in the administration to intervene from the outside in towards regime change. I'm not taking it, sorry. I, I, you know, look, I don't think so. I mean, because President Trump certainly has shown that he's not willing to use military force against Iran, so how would this, how would this take place? And, uh, you know, we do have people in the diaspora who, who oppose the regime, but they're not, certainly don't have the 
the troops <laughs> to go in and, and, and mount an operation like this. So um, I, I would also defer last yeah, word here. I, mean, I don't think this is, this you is know, realistic. Look where Afghanistan and Iraq got us. And Iran is many times larger than both of those countries. Uh, and also the, states, the state is many times stronger than, than either of those governments were at the time of invasion. So if we're stuck in forever wars, this will be a forever, forever, forever war. And I don't think that that's something that's in the strategic interest of the United States. Um, but, you know, we have folks who are very ideological um, on both sides, unfortunately, who are gaining the upper hand. So this is why I think discussions like this are so um, useful to have. And I want you to help join me, please, in thanking the three speakers um, for this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.